Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Deborah Exner, and I am the moderator for this evening's candidate debate. Before we begin, please silence all phones and electronic devices. Additionally, please refrain from any interruptions to the debate because we are being recorded for on-demand viewing and post-captioning services. Joining us this evening is Mr. Tom Collins with the Citizens Clean Elections Commission, and he has something to add. I thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. I, th I think this is, this is great. I just wanted to add briefly, um, the commission and I personally just want to inform the audience and viewers that due to an oversight by the commission staff, um, the House candidate uh, um, Norgard, Jill Norgard, and uh, candidate Representative Bob Robson were not properly notified of this debate uh, this evening. I personally apologize for that happening. Um, we appreciate Mr. Robson's attendance on short notice and note that Ms. Norgard is out of the state, but she would otherwise attend. And so, of course, and again, I, I, uh, I apologize on behalf of of the staff for this, um, and my staff, and, and this is uh, my responsibility to make sure that this happens. Um, I understand there will be other forums that may occur, including the candidates, and of course the staff will continue to work with the candidates in any way to ensure that they, if there's anything else the commission can do with that regard. But I just want you to understand that we are appreciative of Representative Robson appearing and that uh, Ms. Norgard would be here uh, but for a clean elections staff uh, mistake, which I take responsibility for. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign reform and a finance reform and public education measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. The Clean Elections Act was created to allow campaigns to be more issue oriented and less negative. The system provides full funding for qualified candidates who participate voluntarily. The candidates agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules, which include contribution and spending limits, foregoing special interest money, as well as participating in commission debates. The candidates invited to participate in, are in contested general elections. Candidates in uncontested general elections are not included in the debate process. For tonight's debate, questions have been prepared by the Clean Elections Commission based on a voter survey as well as questions that have been submitted by voters through the Clean Elections smartphone app. However, we encourage live audience questions first. If you have questions, please print them clearly on the note cards given to you when you entered and hold them up. Our volunteers will pick up the questions and the cards and deliver them to me. If you need additional cards, just raise your hand. We screen questions for clarity, uh, to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for 90 minutes, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. There's an independent timer who will see to it that our candidates have the allotted time to answer questions and will tell them when their time is up. As a courtesy to the other candidates, please respect the time limits. When the timer raises the stop sign, the moderator, that's me, will stop the candidate. Tonight's debate includes one minute opening statements, a lightning round. The first half of the debate begins with two minutes to answer audience questions. Each candidate will answer the same audience question and will rotate which candidate begins first. After all candidates have responded to the question, the first responding candidate will be given an additional 30 seconds. The second half will allow a different question per candidate with one minute to answer. Then we end with one minute closing statements. If you have a question for a specific candidate, please include the candidate's name on the note card and it will be considered in the second half of the debate. We ask that you remain polite to all of the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with what's being said. Tonight's participants are running for office in District 18. We have Mr. Sean Bowie, a Democrat, running for the office of senator, Mr. Frank Schmuck, a Republican, running for the office of senator, Ms. Mitzi Epstein, Democrat, running for state representative, Ms. Linda Macias from the Green Party, running for state representative, and Mr. Bob Robson, Republican, running for state representative. 
The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name, starting with the Senate for opening comments, and will progress from that starting point. The order for the second half will be determined by reverse alphabetical order, starting with the House. Mr. Bowie, will you start with opening remarks, please? Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. This is a great turnout um, here on a Friday night. Uh, my name is Sean Bowie, and I am running for the State Senate here in, our be here in our community because, like many of you, I am frustrated with our state legislature. I am frustrated with the cuts to our schools, and I'm frustrated with the priorities that our legislators take to the Capitol every day. I'm running to bring new leadership to the state capitol and to represent the values and the priorities that are important to us. A little bit about me, LD18 is my home. I grew up here. I'm a product of our local public schools. And I now work at ASU where every day I get to help make higher education more affordable for working families. My two main priorities as your next state senator are simple. One, I want to restore education funding to strengthen our schools and put them in a stronger place 10, 20, 30 years from now. My second priority, I wanna bring some bipartisanship back to the state capitol, because I believe that government works best when all voices have a seat at the table. Uh, I ask for your vote November 8th, and I look forward to your questions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Frank Schmuck, and I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1988 and I first came to Arizona that year for pilot training at Williams Air Force Base. After earning my wings, I flew the C-141B Starlifter in the first Persian Gulf War. After the war, I was hired by Southwest Airlines where I am still employed as a captain today. I settled in Tempe, Arizona because I love this state and the people who live here. I worked on many civic and charitable projects over the years, including the founding of Tempe Dollars for Scholars, which has now provided scholarships to hundreds of students in our district. It's clear to me that government is not responsive to the people, which it is to serve. I look forward to bringing what I've learned about people, business, and success to our community and state. I'm running for the Arizona State Senate here in District 18 because we deserve better. Ms. Epstein. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Mitzi Epstein. I'm running for the State House of Representatives because we need to support our schools, make better jobs, and keep our neighborhood safe. I'm a computer systems analyst. I've worked for multinational companies, and I run my own small business, Custom Language Training. I went from computer languages to spoken languages because communicating gets things done. I believe children are our future. That's why I served on the Kyrene School Board for four years. That's why I was a youth soccer coach with AYSO. That's why I have been forming statewide coalitions of parents, retirees, business leaders, the whole community. That's why I've been advocating for strong schools for over 25 years. Strong schools mean a thriving economy and just a better quality of life. Thank you. Ms. Macias. Yes, um, I'm Linda Macias, and it's amazing to see this many people out here uh, for a political event. Um, I'm running for State House of Representatives on the Green Party ticket. Um, the main reason I decided to run was because the Green Party got ballot status, and when we get ballot status, we need to get candidates out there so that the Green Party can be be um, out in the, in, the, in the light. And most people don't know that there's another party, a third party, called the Green Party. And another reason I felt I needed to run was a lot like Sean and Mitzi, and I feel like the schools have been cut so badly that our children, which are our, our most valuable resource for sure, are being, are being stifled. They aren't giving, being given what they need. The teachers aren't being given what they need. And so we need to change that. And that's one of the main reasons I want to go down to the state capitol. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Robson. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, and uh, as, as Tom mentioned earlier, got some short notice as to uh, what was going on. So I guess reverse alphabetical order, all the other directions. I'm still, still taking some of that in. But... Uh, <laughs> 
quite quite candidly, uh, I think every one of us, uh, which is really nice to hear from one end of the table to the other, support uh, support education. So I guess we've got that question really dealt with for the evening. Uh, I don't know much much more you can say. Well, there isn't much you can say in in one minute about yourself. Uh, so I guess uh, as most candidates will do in today's world, I'll just direct you to my website, and and hope that you take a look at it. I've been serving uh, in the legislature for uh, 14 years, and uh, I guess I'll be taking some of the brunt of everything people want to change, but uh, to a great degree, I don't think they have the total knowledge or total depth of, of how things really work, and maybe we'll work our way through that, and, and uh, hopefully this evening we'll get some questions answered. Thank you. Thank you. To break the ice, we'll start with a quick lightning round. Please answer with one word. Mr. Schmuck, CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC? Fox News. That's two words. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> Ms. Epstein, Netflix or Hulu? Netflix. Ms. Macias, Lumberjack, Sun Devil, or Wildcat? Oh, Sun Devils. <laughs> That's two words, too. <laughs> Mr. Robson, Pandora or Spotify? Neither. Mr. Bowie, Snapchat or Instagram? Instagram. Thank you. Okay, our first, at this time, we'll begin the portion of the debate where each candidate will answer the same question. The first question is for Mr. Epstein, uh, Ms. Epstein, excuse me. <laughs> if you were to be elected, what would be the first bill you would submit, and what would you consider your most important issue? Education is clearly my most important issue. My chief issue is to restore education funding. We just have to ch change what the direction they've been going in funding our schools in order to keep our great teachers here. But my first bill would be something called Social Emotional Learning for Arizona. It's called SEL for AZ. Social Emotional Learning is a proven program that can be delivered in a variety of different ways. But the most important thing is to use research to be sure that the program works. Social emotional learning, as you might guess, helps children and adults communicate and improve their emotional and social intelligence. It helps us to, when we're children, use our words, not our fists. It helps us when we're adults in the workplace to overcome conflicts constructively. Social emotional learning is a great way to work on reducing the violence in our world because if we can get along together a little better when we're students, we can get along a, to a little better in our workplace, we can just get along a little better in the world. So it's actually part of my program to prevent gun violence and any violence. Social emotional learning, SEL for Arizona. You'll hear a lot more about it from me. Thank you. Ms. Macias, the same question. And I, will you read that question? What Certainly. If you were to be elected, what would be the first bill you would submit, and what would you consider your most important issue to address? Well, the first bill I would introduce has to do with election reform. I think it's obvious uh, when you see how many people turn out uh, to vote in an election that people are disillusioned. They've, they've They've kind of lost their, their faith in the government. Why even go vote? So the, the bill I would like to see uh, introduced has to do with the, the, third, the third parties and how many signatures they need to get to get a candidate on the ballot. The state legislature just changed those numbers. And so tonight you do not see a libertarian here pretty much for that reason. They have to get an enormous amount of signatures to get on the ballot in comparison to the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, it has to do with permanent ballot status, which the libertarians have, as well as the Democrats and the Republicans. The Greens do not have that, but someday we hope to have permanent ballot status. So this, this uh, law that we now have affects the Green Party too down the road. So I would say we need to um, change this so that the Libertarians and the Greens and whatever third party comes along, I guess that'd be the fifth party, I don't know, um, that, that, that we can be represented because I feel that the more representation, the more points of view we have, a much richer and, and a better Arizona will come from that. Thank you. Mr. Robson. 
turn the phones off, but they still call you. <laughs> uh, the, real, the reality is I really don't have a bill that I'm going to go walk through the door and basically sponsor to make you feel happy, uh, quite candidly. It's a, Mits, Mitzi mentioned a piece of legislation, and that's fine, but uh, there's a little thing down there. You have to get 31 people to agree on it to get it out of the House, and you have to get 16 over in the Senate to agree on it, and then you have to do a cost analysis on that legislation. Uh, before it'll go out, and probably the most important, most important piece of work that you're ever going to be involved in, is actually the budget, and so that's the primary driving concern that any member going to the legislature should have is is the budget, not little parts of the budget, but how does the budget work overall? Uh, so uh, that's that's what you start with day one. Now the other things that you you look at, and obviously when uh, you have the opportunity to drop a piece of legislation is when I'm sitting out there in the audience, uh, sitting out with you in the audience, and I'm listening to people that just recently at a round table, uh, how difficult it was to get uh, guardianship for a disabled child. Uh, that's something I'm going to be looking into, because uh, I think that's, that's a very important thing to, obviously, to dis, dis, the community that have, with children have disabilities, and being able to work through that. And some, most of the time, legislation isn't the only thing that you do with the legislature. The other thing is you work and help people solve their problems that they're having with state agencies. And you, 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 try, to bring, you try to bring people together. The worst thing in the world is to start legislating. Because then we all start complaining about how much government is intrusive in your life. So to my goal over the many years that I've been down there is really just to try to, bring, try to bring people together. Try to bring the state agency, bring the director of the agency, try to take care of that problem. When somebody's off uh, and dying of cancer in my district or something and they're only $32 away, from being, uh, being able to have a, a quality of life for the next two weeks, that's important to me, and those are things that you work on. Those are the things you don't necessarily talk about when you're running for office, but those are the things you Thank actually you. do when you're in, uh, in the legislature. Mr. Bowie, same question. Uh, well, my most important issue uh, would be education and restoring education funding, protecting the schools in our district, but as Bob said, that's more of a budgetary thing, and that's going to take you know, a couple of months, and it's hopefully going to have the parties coming together and finding some common ground. Uh, as far as the first bill I would introduce, uh, I would really push for an audit of the state budget because I think you can always find cost savings when it comes to government. We have about a $9 billion budget. There are a couple areas I would look at. Specifically, I would look at our contracts with our for-profit prison companies that the state does business with. Uh, right now, we have contracts, 10, 20, 30-year contracts with some of these companies where we are paying for beds to be filled regardless of whether they're filled or not. So there's no incentive for us to undertake some kind of criminal justice reform, try to reduce that number. We're paying for these beds regardless of whether they're filled. That's crazy to me. And I would look at reforming those contracts and then putting that money into areas like education. So we're talking about a $9 billion budget. I do not want to raise taxes. So when we talk about funding schools, we have some money in the rainy day fund that we can use. We had a surplus last year. We have the resources. I want to go into the state budget really line by line, look for some cost savings, and really put that money into education to further strengthen the schools in our community. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck. Yes, ma'am. The uh, first bill that I would look at doing would be, you know, over a 50-year period, Dr. Irving Fratkin raised a billion dollars for a million students and never took a dollar for himself. When he was 85, 10 years ago, and he's still alive today, he encouraged me to start a chapter, a chapter of Dollars for Scholars. So I did. And now after 10 years, more than 200 students here from our district in our high schools went on to vocational and higher education, and they've done some great things. I've been a proponent of education, and I will remain one. But I think that Prop 123 was a step in the right direction, but did not go far enough. I think what we need is more transparency in our government. We need more transparency to know what teacher salaries are and where the money is truly going. Look, I've been in the airline industry for 20-some years. The most important person is the customer. Before that is the employee. Our employee is the teacher, and the customer is the student and the parents. I want to see more transparency so we get more money to the front line, and that is teachers and students. Um, one way to do that for me, and you'll hear me talk about it, is eliminating the Arizona state income tax. It can be done. Out of ASU is a plan from Stephen Silvinsky, the WP Carey School of Business. 
It would be replaced with a much smaller consumption fee, and we'd broaden our base from 4 million filers to 41 million tourists and our additional 4 million filers. When we do that, business will come, and we'll have more money than we have right now in the income, si income tax system, and that will get directed towards teachers and students through transparency and good legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Epstein, your 30 seconds for additional comment. Oh, how exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will respond to, I've been a school board member, so I really get constituent services, Bob, and I'm really glad you brought that up. Working with the people in the community is very important. As a school board member, I worked a lot to help people solve problems, and I look forward to helping them with state agencies. Also on the school board, I've worked with some pretty big budgets, and the schools are about 47, 49% of the state budget, so I'm pretty darn familiar with that part of the state budget. Looking forward to lots more details. Thank you. Ms. Macias, do you support the Arizona law that allows a woman's employer to ask her about her birth control? No. <laughs> no, I do not. I can't believe that's a law. It is, is it? I'm surprised. I guess I don't know that. Um, no, um, a woman should be able to choose and not have to talk to her employer about her birth control. You, um, I, I'm very, I, I'm still shocked about that question in this day and age. I mean, I, I, I totally uh, think that a woman, that that's her prerogative. And, and, and maybe with her spouse or her partner, I mean, that might be a discussion you would have with, with that person, but not with my employer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robson, same question. I don't think that's the law. I'd like you to cite the law. So I, mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a very... That's a very directed question as to the entire aspect of what the actual overall law is. The question was submitted by three individuals in the audience. Right. Okay. So yeah, there, there's there's more to more to that than meets the eye, and that I think it deals with the health health insurance aspect of, of things. And uh, the question probably should should be: Do you believe that an employer has a right to exclude birth control or or contraceptives from? from a health insurance policy that they're purchasing on behalf of the company. And Thank you. Mr. Bowie. I'm going to echo Linda on this. No, absolutely not. I do not support that. Uh, that really sounds like big government at its worst to me. Uh, it's, it's not limited government. Um, that's something that should be between a woman and her partner and her doctor. Uh, and again, this goes back to the issue of priorities. Uh, we have a state education system that's ranked 48th in the country in K-12 spending, higher education. We've cut more from our universities since 2009 than any state in the country. Tuitions increased by 83% during that time. It's tripled since 2008. So these are pressing problems that we have, and we have a legislature that's focused on this. So that is what, one of the reasons why I'm running, because I think we need new leadership, new voices who are focused on the right things uh, that will move our state forward. So to answer the question, no, I would not support that. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck? Less government, less regulation. That's how I think. And so this is an intrusion on people's rights, and certainly I would not support something like this on the surface of just the question itself. If there was more to it, we'd look at it. But I would like to come back to the issue on the income tax for you. Um, when we replace this with a consumption fee, it's going to be a much smaller consumption fee. And I want you to know we'll, there will be no additional items. We would exempt three basic things, food at the grocery store, clothing, and gasoline by law is required. This will protect people on a fixed income. This will protect those that are, are challenged. They will not see a status quo change. But what we will be able to develop is generate more revenue because we'll have nearly 46 million people paying into that versus just 4 million filers. And with that said, we'll have the freedom to earn here. And when businesses have the freedom to earn, also they can reinvest their capital into one of two things. Back into their business, which will mean more jobs for all of those millennials that are out here that have been educated and are striving to try to find work in our state. They're having to go to Texas and Washington and California even to go get work. We need to bring business here, but we need to do it equitably, equitably, 
not give one business a special deal over another. And this is one great way to treat everyone the same and not disrupt the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Epstein, same question. And would you repeat the question? Because I think we got off topic just a little bit there. Do you support the Arizona law that allows a woman's employer to ask her about her birth control? Of course not. <laughs> your boss, that's just none of your boss's business. And sadly, our incumbent legislature has been doing way too many bills that make your personal life your boss's business. Nothing in your personal life should be your boss's business. Not your choice of birth control. People sometimes say, well, if you don't like your boss's choice of birth control, go so somewhere else, go get another job. Well, that is just not realistic. People who are out there trying to get a job, they can't just go get another job. Therefore, we want to make sure that people who offer jobs offer f it fairly. We have to make sure that your boss stays out of your bedroom and certainly stays out of your birth control. Thank you. Ms. Macias, your 30 seconds to respond. I, I guess I can't think of anything else except that I, I'm still surprised that it is a, a, a law. So I'm, I, I guess I have to uh, talk about Bob's uh, response in that there, there may have been more to it, but still I feel that um, even if you're going to get health care and you want some form of birth control, you should be able to be provided that at the boss or your company should not uh, delete you from having that possibility. Thank you. Mr. Robson, uh, there are actually several questions on this topic, so I've chosen one to represent them. College tuition in Arizona is no longer affordable for most students. What can and should be done to make it more affordable? Wow. Uh, those, those of you who know me have been fighting uh, that battle for a long time down at the legislature. Uh, what we can do is make sure that we adequately fund uh, our universities. I, I am appalled over the fact that we only have three state universities and they should, they should be treated almost like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and whatever. They should be the top flight universities in this country. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that we, ab we somewhat have abandoned that uh, concept. Uh, I didn't support a budget that, uh, that, that cut them by $106 million. I fought, the follow, fought, I fought, fought that budget the following year. I fought for additional funding. Uh, I'm appalled that the Board of Regents only accepted uh, the fact that there was only $8 million that additionally went back. I looked at the previous year as one of the largest single tax increases on the middle class when it came to, univer when it came to sending their students to universities. It was almost a $1,500 increase. It's, it's, it's appalling. Uh, and one minute, I wish I had an hour, uh, quite, <laughs> quite candidly. But uh, yeah, I, I will constantly fight on behalf of, of, of the university system uh, in, in getting additional funds into it. If you have a vibrant university system, you have a vibrant community, you have a vibrant state, and you also have jobs, jobs, jobs. To create, it shows nationally that if university structure and the university system is up and running and appropriately, then the dollars are coming into the state and they're coming in fairly well in not only high paying jobs, but jobs in general. And I yield the balance of my 15 seconds. Thank you. Mr. Bowie, same question. It's a great question. Uh, this really deals with the work I do every day at ASU. Uh, I work in the provost's office at ASU where I get to work on financial aid and we're trying to find ways to make higher education more affordable for working families. And as many of you know, it's been a lot tougher. Uh, over the last decade. Uh, since I graduated in 2008, tuition has gone from $4,000 a year in-state to over $11,000. The average cost of attendance for an in-state student is over $25,000 a year. So you're looking at $100,000 just to go to school, assuming you graduate in four years, which not everybody does. So this is a problem that's very personal for me. I could rattle off the stats all night long. I mean, I mentioned them earlier, the 48% cut in the state support, the 83% increase in tuition. I am so proud of the work that we've done at ASU over the years. We were just named the number one university in the country in innovation for the second year in a row. And I always joke, we have to be innovative because we have to find new revenue streams because the state isn't supporting us anymore to the extent that they were. So this is an area where the legislature, they fund ASU, they fund the three universities. So this is an area where we can directly impact the affordability of higher education if we had a legislature that made it its number one priority. 
And right now you're seeing for-profit prisons being funded. You're seeing tax cuts being funded. I think we should have tax cuts to spur economic growth, but I don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket because when you don't invest in education, fewer companies are going to want to move to Arizona. Our tax rates are pretty low, especially compared to California and our neighboring states. We have a great climate. People are always going to want to move to Arizona. But some businesses are saying no because we're not showing a commitment to education. So for me, I can promise you right now in the Senate, I will not vote for any budget that does not increase investment in education, both K-12 and higher ed. We have the resources. We have over half a billion dollars sitting in our rainy day fund. We had a surplus last year of several hundred million dollars. This can be done. We just need to elect legislators who will make it their top priority, and I intend to do that in the state Senate. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, same question. Yes, your question was college tuition is not affordable. What can we do? You're right. We graphed three things. Inflation, the average price of an airline ticket from the Department of Transportation across the entire United States. Those two lines were pretty much neck and neck. Then we graphed the cost of in-state tuition and expenses here in Arizona since 2001 to 2015. I've seen a lot of curves in my life, and this curve took off faster than a rocket ship. It's out of control. You know, Travis Brown is a author who did a significant study, 15-year study, looking at income tax returns across the United States. Each year, where they, what address they were filed on, and then the next year, what address did they go to? Literally, millions of people and billions of dollars are moving from higher income tax states to lower to no income tax states. When we eliminate the Arizona state income tax, we're going to replace it with a much smaller consumption fee, and it's going to generate a lot more money. That money is going to get to go to education, not for everyone to just dictate what they need to do, but to the front line. It's going to go to the teachers and the students. That's the most important thing. But by eliminating the Arizona state income tax, we're going to be able to bring more business here. And the same people we're educating are going to be able to stay here in our state and get higher paying jobs because undoubtedly, because of our tax structure, we will become an epicenter for technology. I look forward to working with Democrats and Republicans both to find the right answer so that our citizens, our students, can actually go to school like the Constitution guarantees at or near free. Thank you. Ms. Epstein. The question was, what do I, we want to do to improve college tuition and affordability, right? It wasn't about the income tax or anything, right? Uh, this was college tuition in Arizona is no longer affordable for most students. What can and should be done to make it more affordable? Okay, so what we can and should do is first address that it is a problem. I would agree with uh, Board of Regents President Eileen Klein that we need to look at tuition specifically. So yes, the price of college has gone up. We have to address the fact that we cannot just keep increasing tuition to cover the cost. So Eileen Klein has called for, let's have the state cover 50% of tuition, make it a 50-50 deal with our families. And that would be a lot better than the incredibly low percentage of 10 or 20% it is right now. So f thank you very much, 24% roughly. There's the ballpark. We have to improve that ballpark. Eileen Klein also made a comment that uh, GoDaddy CEO Blake Irving said that ASU has smart, well-educated students to help fuel technology for us for decades. And the, there's a long list of accolades for us about our top flight graduates. But we're not going to be able to continue and sustain our job growth if we can't make tuition affordable. We've got to do that, and it means in investing in our universities, mainly for tuition, but also for research. We are in a hotbed of innovation right here at, for our business growth. We want to focus on the innovation economy because that's where the high-tech jobs are. In order to do that, to keep aerospace growing and high-tech growing, we want to in actually invest in our universities. Going forward, the legislature should seek to decrease to tuition. Let's bring that tuition down so that families can find it affordable because when you have the goal of working hard and making a better career, you should be rewarded. You shouldn't be punished with crippling debt. Thank you. Ms. Macias. Yes, um, I think it was mentioned by someone, I'm not sure who, I think it was um, Mr. Schmuck, that um, 
The Constitution of Arizona does state that higher education should be nearly free. Well, uh, it's a long way from that. My two daughters have uh, student loans that they will probably be paying for the rest of their lives because one's a school teacher and the other's a um, social worker, so uh, they'll, they'll be paying for quite a long time. And I tell this story, and people don't believe me, they think I had to be high on something, but when I lived in California in the mid-60s, junior college was totally free. I had to buy my books, and that was it. And I think if nothing less, we should at least uh, follow uh, President Obama's idea of having the, the junior colleges be free so that the vocation can be learned or you can move on to a four-year school. Um, the other thing I would say is where are we going to get this money? Well, I think if we stopped investing in private prisons and had them run by the state, I know we could save a ton of money. Uh, right now, it costs $25,000 a year to pay for an inmate who's in the, in the prison system. If that person who didn't commit a violent crime but was caught with drug uh, possession, if that person was able to be in the community but being supervised and on some kind of a, of a um, program, it's $800 a year per person. So we're looking at 45,000 inmates that are in there for drug possession at 25,000 each, which is $1.1 billion we are paying, and we could use that so well in our universities to help our students have a lot less burden once they get out. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Robson, your 30 seconds. I get the 30 seconds this time, okay. Uh, back to the health question. Uh, my answer to that is no, because I didn't make that clear. I just uh, What happened was I moved and said, I don't think that's the entire part of the law. Uh, I, I think it's totally ridiculous that any employer would ask anybody their health uh, conditions unless you're you know, running for athlete or something or for President of the United States. <laughs> and I've yielded back the balance of my time. Thank you. Next question is, how did you, and the next question begins with Mr. Bowie, how did you or would you vote on the two water bills, SB 1268 and SB 1400, and why? Not familiar with those particular bills. Um, I have some bills memorized, but not those, apparently. Um, uh, we have to go in order. water bills, am I on? There were two water bills that I'll do my very best to present this in an unbiased manner <laughs> that would have allowed for developers to add developments in southern Arizona, add more houses uh, without the assurance of 100 years water supply as was the norm in that zone at the time. So it would have allowed for more use, the developers to add more houses without assurances of a 100 year water supply. Question. I was ready to answer. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you <laughs> know, I mean, I was. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, I thought everybody that's was okay. I mean, would SB whatever it was. That's the moderator's okay. choice here. Yeah. What do you want to do? So, how, how about if we go back to Mr. Bowie for one minute left? That yeah, you, Mr. Okay. As, a general, as a general question, um, I like to n read the bill, know what I'm talking about before I speak about something, um, and certainly before I would vote on something. Uh, so I think development is important uh, generally, but we also need to make sure, you know, water is a significant problem for our state long term. Uh, the state's get on, done a good job of planning that over the last couple decades, but, you know, we have to be more vigilant. We have to make sure that there are water guarantees in place and that we don't turn into the next California and have to have extreme rationing and cut off people's water. I don't think anybody wants that. So uh, I would obviously want to read the bill before I comment on it. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, same question. Um, I would say the same thing. You always want to read the bill before you vote on a bill. Um, but I would build more infrastructure. And let me just say that, you know, as an airline pilot, I get the opportunity weekly to go out and fly and see what other states are doing from a bird's eyes view. I get to see the reservoirs, the dams, the lakes, and I can tell you they're down.
But what saddens me a lot is uh, California is buying their water when they're flushing a lot of it into the ocean and into streams. And so it's so important to build infrastructure. I would be extremely supportive of, of enhancing the dams we have and possibly even building more dams because I think water is our lifeline. We got two things, air conditioning and water, right? And, and water is so important to Arizonans, not just to drink, it's our food supply. We have a great agriculture in the state that a lot of people don't even appreciate because we're in a metropolis. And I think that is, is another form of business that we can provide not only to our, our people, but also to other states. And so when it comes to water rights, um, I, again, would love to be able to enhance the existing dams we have and um, possibly even build new because I think that would be forward thinking for a, a larger scale state of more people coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, could you please hold your applause so that we can proceed with the debate. Thank you very much. Ms. Epstein. The bills were important to me, as you may have noticed. <laughs> Water is crucial for us. We live in a desert, and we need sustainable supplies. Our Groundwater Management Act from 1980 and so on has been working very, very well for us. Metro areas have assurances, while rural, rural areas only have a warning system. So we get assured 100-year supply. Rural areas are sort of, well, you might run out. We really need some better plans for our water in Arizona. We can't just assume that what we're doing now is going to be fine. It's not going to be fine going into the future. So the legislature has to pass protections to ensure that all of Arizona has a secure supply of water. I was disappointed that both of my opponents voted for those bills that degrade our Water Management uh, Act. Fortunately, they were vetoed, so they did not become law. But I believe in doing the homework. And you mentioned, uh, Mr. Schmuck, about reading the bills before you vote on them. Sadly, the bills are pushed through there so fast that there are so many bills that legislators do not even read. They go along with their caucus. And I would advocate for a better process where we're vetting our bills better than that so that things like this can come up and we have time to do the homework and vote to protect water. I will be your voice in the legislature to strongly fight for sustainable water solutions. Thank you. Ms. Macias. Yes, um, I, I'm so glad you did that. Give us the explanation, Amitzi. Um, I do remember reading that in a questionnaire that one of the um, groups that often sends questionnaires to people that are running for office. And I, I definitely feel that in, in the rural areas, we have to have the same kind of protection that we have in, in the metropolis uh, where there's at least 100 years supply of water, which, I don't know, that almost sounds like not enough. <laughs> Because, I mean, we've got grandkids and great-grandkids. And uh, the Green Party, of course, one of our biggest concerns is the environment. And not only do we have enough water, but are we protecting that, that supply? And so, um, you know, it's very important that we don't do things like fracking that can really ruin our water supply. And um, the Green Party really does take to heart that, that water and air and soil are the, the, the God-given things that all of us have. And if we decide or un unknowingly decide to ruin that for the rest of time, um, we've done a real huge disservice to the people that are following us. And so, yes, I feel like uh, we need to protect the water supply, make sure that it's there, but all more importantly, make sure that it's healthy. Thank you. Mr. Robson. My question up front, uh, did many people get these questions beforehand? Because a lot of people up here are reading the answers. Uh, you know, no. The okay, so I guess it's submitted by people that they know. That's, that's okay. As long as it's submitted by people they know, it's fair, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we're drinking water up here. Water, water, is, water is important. Uh, the 100-year situation, uh, the, the the, water, the way the water, groundwater acts are, uh, are done in the state. I mean, John Kyle, whole mess of people over the years had vision uh, to, to, to make sure that water came into the valley. Uh, we're going to do the best, obviously the best we can, but we also understand that circumstances are different in various areas of the state. And some of their economic development and their economic growth is dependent upon possibly 
loosening up certain things to be able to let them develop. So we're not all, we all live, you know, people here live in Maricopa County, but when you become a state representative, you have to have a little broader uh, depth in, 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 in where you're heading and, and, uh, and understand that some rural communities need to have a little more leeway and a little more, a little more direction. Not, not that they're taking the water away, but they have an opportunity to move a little bit so that uh, development can occur, not housing development, but jobs can occur in those areas and everything else. I remember when I was on the city council in Chandler and we did the uh, Intel uh, plant out here, which we're, I think everybody in this room is probably proud of, uh, we worked on uh, the water issue quite, uh, quite heavily and we could be very proud of what we were able to do as a community in Chandler in as much as it, the, the water that comes out of Intel that we gave it on the front end to do their processing, coming out of the back end goes through a reverse osmosis, goes to rege regenerates itself, it becomes better than drinking water quality, and it's pumped back into the aquifer. Those are things that can happen in outlying areas as well if you loosen up some of those standards and understand that those things are happening. So you can't just be totally dismissive of saying, oh, you voted to get rid of everything else. You know, you didn't understand what was going on. I understand what's going on, but I recognize that it's not all housing, and things can go through recharge, things can go back into the aquifer better than the way they came out, and better than the way you gave it to them. So not everything is just simple legislation. It got voted for, it got voted against. There, there, there are other parts of the state that need to have uh, the ability to be able to develop as well. Your 30-second response. Uh, and just to echo what's been said several times, uh, infrastructure planning, especially long-term planning, is important. Uh, as Frank said, I'd be open as well to more dams and more water resource development. That's uh, infrastructure is something that creates jobs, especially in rural areas. So I'd definitely be open to looking at that because I, th I think at the end of the day, we do not want to turn to California. And I think with some smart short-term and long-term planning, we can get that done. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, next question. What are your plans to alleviate hunger in our state and district? Well, what I would say is uh, when it comes to poverty, um, I come from humble upbringings. My father was a state employee. And I can remember, my mother's here tonight, I can remember weeks where we sat wondering when the state budget was going to pass so we could put food on the table or they could put food on the table for us. I was young enough yet old enough to realize that was taking place. I've never forgotten that. And uh, I think it's an important aspect of our society. You know, we have charity for a reason. And there's two things a person can give you, their time or their money. And I think the most important of those things is your time. Our family has, and we continue to do, we've spent even some Thanksgivings and Christmas with the homeless, feeding them, helping them. And I think it's an important aspect of, try of our society. Whether government has the right to do that or not or should be doing that is a whole different story. But your question, if you would state it again for me again, what I specifically would do. What are your plans to alleviate hunger in our state and district? I don't have an answer for that except to encourage more on the charitable side for people to want to give their time and energy to help those that are homeless. There's some great programs out there. I help is one. Um, and I've seen some great things come out of those things because there are people that have been able to move forward in the, their life and basically not have a way of life uh, in far as an entitlement would go, but be able to move forward into a job, getting a home, and changing their life. As Dave Ramsey says, says change the family tree. And so when we can pr create an environment Again, I go back to the tax thing. If we can eliminate our tax and have more business, we're going to be able to do that and give more jobs to people and educate our students by getting money to the teachers and the students. Thank you. Ms. Epstein. A couple years ago, I took the SNAP challenge. It's SNAP is the food stamps. I tried to live on about $2.90 a week or a day. Either way, it was outrageous. My cup of coffee t took three days' worth of, of food. It was just, and that's what we are doing to, pre to prevent hunger. We can do so much more. And uh, Mr. Schmuck, charity is nowhere near enough. That will not solve hunger for the many, many children we have in Arizona who are hungry. When children are hungry, they cannot learn, and they cannot become productive adults. It behooves all of us to help all families have stability. When families become unstable, our whole economy 
gets on rocky ground. If you're the family who, in need, or the family's landlord, or the family's boss, you want that family to be stable. That just makes economic sense. Therefore, we should not have cut our TANF benefits in half. TANF is, TANF is temporary assistance for needy families. These are the neediest families you can imagine. I think it's under $3,000 a year that they make. And they are families, so we're talking about children. We're talking about food on the table for children. And the legislature, the incumbents, cut the benefit in half. It used to be you could get those benefits over the course of your whole life for two years and they cut it down to only one year. That is just not enough for a single mom or a single dad to get back on their feet after they've been going through a terrible divorce or a domestic violence situation, which so often tends to be the case. We can do so much more and it was a piddling little amount of only like $9 million, nothing on the order of business for this state. It was mean, and that was all that I have to say about it. So number one, we could restore TANF benefits to two years, not one year. Thank you. Ms. Macias. Uh, yeah, I think most of us know uh, the numbers that uh, one in four children in Arizona uh, are, are not having enough food. They don't get enough food. One in seven seniors are in the same position. And I have to agree with Mitzi that the cutting of the, um, I'm not even sure what it's called, but I read it in another survey that we were asked about, that from two years to be able to get assistance down to one year. And if we're able to give tax cuts to big corporations so that they can come here and, and make a lot of money, but we are not willing to feed our children and our seniors and everybody in between that needs that food, I think we're doing the wrong thing as, as, as legislatures. And to look at who voted us in and why are we here and are we here to serve the people of Arizona? That's what I think. That's what the Green Party thinks, that that's what government needs to do, is to be beholden to the people that got them into office. Um, the other thing, I, I, I got another survey from another group, and I did not know this, but right now we are spending as a state two million dollars for a fingerprinting uh, rigmarole that you have to have in order to get your food stamps. We are the only state that does that. We have other ways of getting the information we need about the people that are on food stamps rather than being afraid that they're going to commit food stamp fraud because when that happened uh, with this two million dollar fingerprinting um, rigmarole is what I call it, uh, in 2015 only seven cases were um, investigated about um, food stamp fraud. So we could save $2 million if we did away with that particular part of the food stamp program. Um, so I think there's places we can improve and, and, and feed the people of Arizona that need it. Thank you. Mr. Robson. I guess my opponent mentioned that I voted for that. When did I do that? In the budget. What budget? 2015 and 2016, I believe. They no, I, I voted against the, I, oh, I, yes. I didn't vote on the previous budget where that happened. Uh, so you might want to realign your facts. I mean, I'm not going to so get, there's Mr. a few times. and if you can address the audience. I'll address, she's here, and she made a statement that I did something. Okay. I'm dealing with it. <laughs> All right? That's the only way you do it. You said it's fairness, right? It, it's, it's fine for you to comment on. You talk about fairness. It's fine for you to comment. It's not, the conversation's the problem. Well, I'm commenting. Fairness is fair. And she said I did something, which I didn't do. So therefore, I'm making the record straight. Uh, I've served on uh, various boards, and, uh, and I, uh, Frank uh, early on said the private sector. I guess if we abandon the private sector and we just go to the government sector, we're going to have some major problems. Uh, I've been, I was, I was uh, chaired the Salvation Army Advisory Board for many years in Chandler. I've been in Kiwanis. Uh, Frank has been in Kiwanis as well. You know, uh, we recognize, and, and you can't you can't turn you can't just say, "Look what you've done to yourself." Pick yourself up by your bootstraps and do with it. You got to you got to help people. There are genuine problems out there, and we've gone through since 2008 as a community. We've gone through a lot. Uh, people could probably tell you that their neighbors that they had in the past are, are not there in many respects because of the hard times that uh, that we've gone through as a state and a nation. So yeah, I understand that uh, you know these subsidy uh, programs are very important, but at the same time, the private sector. 
does get heavily engaged and they help people get back on their feet. And that's not everything that government can do. Government is not the total answer to solving all of these problems. Thank you. Please hold your applause so we can move on. Mr. Bowie. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a state safety net uh, through the Department of Economic Security. And it's important that we be, vi be vigilant about auditing DES and making sure that the resources that are put into TANF and the others are not being abused. Uh, so those benefits have been cut. We now have one of the strictest uh, TANF uh, regulations in the country. Uh, I think it was a little too harsh. Um, I agree with Frank. I mean, a lot of this should be done at the private level, and I think it is. And there are a lot of great charities here in the district. Um, I was just at the Kyrene Resource Center a couple weeks ago um, donating supplies. Uh, so we d I would argue for a kind of a hybrid approach. I mean, the private sector is going to take up the bulk of this. Um, but we do have a state safety net in place that we've had for many, many decades. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can within DES to make sure that the resources and the benefits are going to those that do truly need it and they get the help they need to find work uh, so they're no longer eligible for those benefits and they no longer need those benefits. So I think working with the private sector, I think that's the best approach. As Bob said, this is not something that government can solve by itself. Uh, we should be looking at public and private partnerships um, to really benefit those in need in our community. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, your 30 seconds. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It was mentioned that charity is not enough. I've been to a Mesa at Feed My Starving Children, and I've been over to Glendale, two different sides of the valley, and both times stocking foods with volunteers, many people coming out, and to give to children food for the weekend because they don't get enough. And you know what? We still had more food. There were, we had more food than we could give out. I really believe, like Bob said and many others, even Sean said, that government's not the solution in this. I think private and charity does a better job and does it much better than the rest of us. Thank you. Now we will transition to the part of the debate where each candidate will receive a separate question with one minute to respond. For this part, we move from the uh, reverse alphabetical order starting with the House. Remember that you can still submit questions for uh, and direct them to specific candidates, just write their name on the card. So the first question is for Mr. Robson. Since you're a part of the House Majority Leadership and you say you're pro-education, why is Arizona ranked 49 with educational funding? When I got there, it was still ranked 49. Uh, I, you know, it's, we're <laughs> working on trying to deal with it, but you're talking to somebody who actually held an entire legislative session up on education issues. Two budgets. Uh, several of us got together in a coalition of people and we w basically said, look, this is disingenuous one year. We walked out. I mean, I, you can probably look at the front page of the uh, Capital Times where you had us walking back basically uh, saying, look, this is this is disingenuous and uh, we need to deal better, with, deal, deal better with education. And we were able to get things done. This year, we were able to get more, in, uh, more into the education budget as well and actually uh, benefit uh, the school systems uh, that we represent. We represent five school districts, and all of them have different issues. And Chandler would have lost $13 million, but a coalition of us basically got together, along with the, the other legislators in the near, nearby districts, uh, recognizing that this would have been a, a, a major uh, problem for the schools. So uh, I, it's nothing new to the world that I've been fighting for education. Thank you. Ms. Macias. How would, uh, excuse me, I'm going into the question. What do you intend to do as a part of the government about bringing business and creating more jobs? Well, to me, the, the base of creating more jobs is having a wonderful um, education system. I think uh, companies want to come to a, a state where their kids are going to have a good education and that the people that are going to maybe be part of these uh, new jobs that are coming, these new companies that are coming, those folks have had a good education. I mean, I think a lot of, all of our problems go back to the fact that we need to fund education first and foremost. Um, I think the thing that bothers me the most about funding education is that at the end of the year, the fiscal year, June 2016, there was $364 million left over in our education budget that, that we didn't use, as I understand it. That, that, that seems odd to me, that we have millions of dollars sitting there, and then we want Prop 123 to pass because we need more money. Thank you. 
Ms. Epstein, ASU wants more funding, yet they spent $500,000 for a donation to the Clinton Foundation. Isn't this a waste, uh, waste of money that should have been for students? I have no control over ASU's donations to the Clinton Foundation or anything else. So I've never met any of the Clintons, and I sure don't have them on speed dial. So. Uh, as far as ASU goes, yes, we should invest in them. And, and uh, audits are the way to control things that we don't like. And I would be in favor of turning on audits for things like our private prisons that the incumbents turned off. I would be interested in putting on audits on all of our schools, including our charter schools, so that because the audits we have on our district schools surely must be useful, let's have them for our charter schools as well. And if ASU needs better audits to watch out for things like that. I'm all in favor of audits. Accountability is how we avoid waste and stop things like downright uh, inappropriate deals and corruption. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, please explain your view of Common Core and if you think the program is appropriate for Arizona children. Uh, when it comes to Common Core, I, first of all, I think local control of government is the best control. I think parents first know the best for their children. That's where education starts in the home. Teachers enhance that. And when it comes to Common Core, um, I'm not a proponent of it. I think that it's more big business trying to put pressure our education system. I think parents want to do what is right for their children, and they don't want to be told what to do by one business over another. And so for that, I would, I, I'm not a fan of Common Core. Thank you. Mr. Bowie, do you agree that the 202 extension on uh, Picos Road is on sacred Native American lands? And if so, what can you do to stop it? Well, as an Ahwatukee resident, um, you know, this has been an issue that's been on the books for 20 or 30 years. Um, I do not support the current route um, that's going through Ahwatukee. Uh, as an Ahwatukee resident, I don't like that it's being built through the neighborhood, that homes are being destroyed, uh, the church, a school. I think this, if this is something we have to live with, we, we need to make it livable. And right now, with the elevated grade that they're talking about, um, the, the model that I look at for freeway development is State Route 51 which was done a couple decades ago, where they really worked with the local community, they installed noise barriers. I think that was done in the appropriate way and, and it's been a great success. So for the 202, ideally, I would look at going back to the drawing board and figuring out a way to you know, satisfy Ahwatukee, uh, our Native American tribe to the, to the south, we can work with them and try to find an agreement. Uh, but right now, I have a lot of concerns about the current route, the current structure, and I would certainly uh, work with um, ADOT, uh, City of Phoenix, to try to come up with a better solution. Thank you. Mr. Robson, what is your position on expanding empowerment scholarship accounts? I think we should put all the uh, scholarship accounts on hold at this point until we can truly justify where the dollars are going uh, from an education perspective. Uh, when we started the empowerment scholarship accounts some years ago, we did them for special needs purposes. Uh, those I support wholeheartedly because there's certain things that kids just can't get into public schools and they, they, they have an opportunity to be able to move and, and locate where they're going. But to, to extend it to 900,000 students statewide, I think that's that without, without any understanding of, of, of where we're headed, I think would, be, uh, would decimate one public education as we know it today. Uh, but I, I think uh, when you deal with special needs interest, uh, special needs in the interest of those students, I think they're, they're viable. Thank you. Ms. Macias, what new and fresh ideas for educational funding priorities would you bring to the next legislative session? Well, I think I've already stated one of the ways we can um, bring money to education, and that is the private, pr private prison situation that we have here. I feel that we need to move in the direction of California where um, all drug-related possessions are misdemeanors. They're not um, felonies. These folks are people who are, are <laughs> we're spending a lot of money on them. They're in prison. We're spending $25 each on them. And I think if we could take that 
$1.1 billion that we're spending on these folks that are in prison for nonviolent crimes. They're, they're, they could be in the community being supervised. I think that is one place we could really bring in a lot of money for the, for the schools. Thank you. Ms. Epstein, after passage of 123, what do you think the next step should be? Oh, that's my favorite question. We definitely need to take those next steps. We need to restore education funding. It's the most important thing we have to do in this state. And it's not just I'm saying it. The Alliance Bank survey of CEOs recently said the number one thing we have to do to, for a, our economy is to invest in education. So the next steps could include things like Linda mentioned and Sean mentioned. We can stop these prison contracts that guarantee beds, no matter whether we have prisoners or not, we could reduce recidivism and make our state safer by doing some other prison reforms. We could look to our county's savings accounts to see if we could improve our revenue there. Like we have improved our revenue with our state uh, land trust accounts, let's improve our county accounts as well. But more than anything else, we've got to stop making new tax loopholes. It's like we are growing and our bucket of funding is growing, but we keep making holes in it. So stop the loopholes. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, if you favor cutting taxes, how do you propose to fund schools sufficiently? Well, I think I've already addressed that some, but let me just say this. Prop 123 didn't go far enough. We have two children, 16 and 12, high school, middle school. We go to meet the teacher night, and I'm expecting to hear this briefing on how we're gonna be doing great things. And I get introduced to the new director of this, the new director of that, the new director of this. I go into the classroom, the laundry list of needs I thought would be shorter, it's longer, and a teacher gets $9 a month pay raise. Wow. We need to get money to our teachers and students. And to do that, we eliminate the Arizona state income tax, placing it with a consumption fee on all items except for basic food and clothing and, and fuel. It protects those on a fixed income. We will generate more than the $3.5 billion we have in income tax right now by spreading it across 45 million people to pay less than 1% than the 4.5% we're paying in income tax for some people. And when we do that, we'll have more revenue that we can direct immediately to teachers and students, not more administration. Thank you. Mr. Bowie, what is your position on the Kid Care program? Kids Care. Kids Care. Uh, well, I was very happy to see it pass this last session. Uh, Arizona was the only state in the country um, that was not funding kids care. Uh, it took until I think May, it took until the last week or two of the legislature, something that should have been done several years ago. Uh, we ran the numbers and it was about 950 children in our district. Uh, we're poor children, we're going without health care because of the extremism of our state legislature. So I was very happy to finally see it get done. Um, this is a federally funded program. It did not cost the state anything. And I know people wanna see less government, but that's money that would have gone to other states. Uh, it wouldn't have been sent back to the taxpayers. So it's important that we get those resources into the state of Arizona. Uh, I definitely wanna see it continue in the future and I'd be opposed to any future cuts to kids care. Um, but like I said, when I think about that issue, I think about the 950 children who now have health care um, because of the legislature's actions. So I was very happy to see it pass this last session. Thank you. Mr. Robson, do you support term limits for our state elected officials? Why or why not? Why not? Oh, I thought that was a one word, answer it with two words. Uh, some days I do, and some days I don't. Uh, quite candidly, it's, 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 it's really tough for people to get up to speed at the legislature and then all of a sudden you're changing them out. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like taking a CEO of a company or you know, top management and just moving it out of there. Reality, will it ever change? I don't think so. I don't think the, the, the will of the, uh, the people are there, quite candidly. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen where term limits are, are not beneficial to uh, the overall operation. Uh, uh, and how things, how things could actually be better. Thank you. Ms. Macias, how would you vote on bills that take authority away from our cities to self-govern? Oh, I would vote against that kind of a bill. I think cities and towns should be able to um, 
use innovative thinking. A lot of times, you know, they're closer to their neighborhoods, their problems, and I think when we take away, as a state legislature, their ability to um, percolate some great ideas that might even move on to the state legislature. Uh, I'm thinking of a couple, and they're small, but I mean, I think the city of Tempe wanted to have no plastic bags, you know, and I, I think that that's something that is, as a Green Party person, that I think that's a really great idea. But if, if the state doesn't allow us to do those kind of things, I think we're, we're, we need grassroots democracy. We need homegrown ideas. And to take that away from cities and towns is not a good idea. Thank you. Ms. Epstein, will you support parental rights to opt out of anything they deem questionable? Surveys, assessments, et cetera, why or why not? I've been advocating with parents for over 25 years, helping them to speak up, to know their rights, and more importantly, how to advocate respectfully, how to work with the people in the system. And I, I think there's a fine line to be drawn between finding a way for a student who just has nightmares about having a test and ulcers, that person, the, the uh, family ought to be able to opt out. But we can't let every child opt out of our accountability me measures. Taxpayers deserve accountability for our schools. We can't let go to a system of, say, private schools where you, we have no tests to find out if the schools are, children are learning or not. So we have to work together. And I've been collaborating, building coalitions across the state of parents, teachers, school people, for 25 years, so we can find a good solution to what's best for children by working together on that. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, what do you plan to do to promote the solar industry? Wow, that's a good question. You probably asked the wrong guy on that because you would get an earful if I had more than a minute. But I believe in it. I think it's a good thing. I really do. Uh, but the problem is, just as I was going to the airport one day and a guy had an SRP shirt on and I said, we should have used solar here to power these fans that were by where the light rail is, uh, he says to me, that's crazy because it's created an unpredictability for our power companies. And he's right. But solar is good. And I think as storage uh, opportunity becomes available for us, like Tesla's working on the battery and what have you, it will be an even better product. But today it's a great product for Arizona and I think we miss opportunities where businesses with solar would want to come here and do their business because we have a, a tax structure that's not good for everyone. Thank you. Mr. Bowie, this has got two parts. What are your, what's your stance on illegal immigrants and will you enforce current laws to secure the border? border? Well, I think securing the border is very important. I think we need to be doing more than we're doing now. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled on this. They've ruled that it's largely a federal issue. Um, but certainly, you know, in Arizona and the other three bordering states, you know, that's not good enough for us. We need to be doing more to make sure the, the personnel have the resources they need, that the technology is there. Uh, we need to be doing more. I think the Obama administration hasn't done enough. And I would certainly support anything we do at the state level to give our Border Patrol agents the resources they need, let the county sheriffs, you know, give them the tools they need and let them do their job. Um, so for me, you know, it's largely a federal issue, but I think everyone's opposed to illegal immigration. And there are things that we can do at the border to secure it. I'm personally not supportive of a wall, uh, mainly because when I read about the border, I read a lot about tunnels and uh, criminals digging tunnels. And you can build a 50-foot golden wall and if people build tunnels through it, you've you know just wasted a lot of money. So I don't know you. if we have the technology for that yet. Um, that's going to cost a lot of money. Thank you. Um, Time is up. Okay. Mr. Robson, an audience member wrote that you missed several important votes, including the 2015 budget and SB 1516. Um, should we support someone that doesn't show up to vote and do their job? Wow. Let's see. 14 years, and I missed what? How many votes? Uh, the, the 2015 budget, I was actually sick. You know, if you need a doctor's note, I'll get it for you. Uh, quite candidly, I was flat on my back. And uh, I don't know, when, you, when people throw out numbers, I, it's, it, every year the same numbers come out, so I don't know what bill somebody's referring to. Uh, what was the SB? Sorry. It, it I'm sorry to do that to you. That's okay. Um, <coughs> SB 1516. And they didn't say what it was, right? No. Okay, so I... 
I miss that one too? Yes. Okay, I was sick. So, yeah. Or the, yeah, that, the 15, 16 was this year? Yes, sir. I was in China. <laughs> I, I couldn't vote on it. I was actually on state business in China. Thank you. Ms. Macias, what is your position toward the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, commonly referred to as Obamacare? Well, um, when it was being studied and decided on what we should do back in, I think, 2010, I want to say, uh, maybe it was 20, 2008, um, the Green Party and myself included, we definitely wanted health care uh, for all. We wanted Medicare, expanded Medicare for everyone. The day you're born, you are on Medicare. We feel that um, we a healthy citizenry is what we want and if people are going to the emergency room when they're the the, the illness or the the debilitating uh, problem has gone too far we're spending far more money than if we um you know had health care for everyone and back then it wasn't even being talked about you you couldn't even uh, the the group that was studying it wasn't even uh considering medicare for all um we feel that that's, the Green Party feels that that is actually a, a, a right that people should have, health care, all of us. Thank you. Ms. Epstein, what is your position on voters having to provide identification in order to vote in Arizona elections? I believe we should do everything possible to help more people vote. I believe that we need to bring all the stakeholders to the table every time we want to get a strong solution. The more ideas you bring, the stronger the solution will be. That's why we need to increase voter participation, not decrease it. One thing that I might support if, with further input is automatic registration with your uh, driver's license. The bottom line is, let's get more people involved in our civic process, not fewer people involved. And I have to answer Mr. Schmuck on taxes. Uh, I don't like taxes, but here's the good news on taxes. It takes two-thirds of the legislature to increase your taxes, so none of us are going to increase your taxes up here. Just put that aside. Nobody's going to increase taxes. It takes two-thirds of a vote. But if we go to all sales tax, that will make our lives for our millennials and our seniors even worse. We have a terribly regressive tax system right now where millennials pay higher tax rates than their parents, and I will go into it more later. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck, what are your thoughts on increasing the state's minimum wage? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what I would say on that is, um, you know, we have an opportunity here. Uh, you're talking basically about Prop 206, correct? Is that what you, or the question is? It's increasing the minimum wage, right? Um, I don't think our founding fathers ever intended to have propositions come to this state that were from people that don't live in this state. We've been getting forced on over and over and over again from California and Washington for prop. We have two of them that are on the thing, on the uh, ballot this time. I don't think that was ever the intent for them. If the citizens of Arizona truly wanted it, why didn't the citizens of Arizona pr propose it? Um, and to answer your question, we are exempting basic food, clothing, and gasoline. How does that hurt people that are poor? I don't understand, or seniors. Thank you. Mr. Bowie, how do you intend to attract new businesses and jobs to Arizona? I think there's a couple things we can do. I mean, again, part of it goes back to education, and not just K-12 and uh, higher ed. I mean, you look at our community colleges, you look at our job training, uh, for technical skills. A lot of those programs have been cut over the years. So a lot of our tax rates are pretty low. I mean, our state uh, income tax rate is one of the 10 lowest in the country. Uh, property taxes, especially when you look at California, Colorado, some of our neighboring states, we compare pretty well when it comes to taxation. Uh, but we definitely invest a lot less in education. So I think we can be doing more. ASU is doing a great job. I'm biased because I work there. Uh, but I think our universities are doing a great job with the resources they have. Uh, a lot of the programs that they've started, engineering, uh, bio design, uh, really great nationally recognized programs. They've done a great job with the limited resources they have. So I think we had a legislature that is really focused on economic development, education, also targeted um, tax credits. I think those can be a good thing as long as they're done responsibly and they're going to jobs that are coming to Arizona, but most importantly, are gonna be staying in Arizona. Time is up. 
Now we are at the place for our closing statements. Mr. Robson, your closing statement, please. Well, thank you. Uh, th thanks for being here. I hope we entertained uh, as best as we possibly could, quite candidly. Uh, sometimes you're, you're asked questions that uh, I guess the person on the other end has done, believe they've done the research and uh, gone, gone a little bit far. Uh, so ba the 2015 budget, no, I wasn't there. I was sick. And there was no way I was going to get there. I was, I was flat on my back. And uh, matter of fact, a few of the uh, community events that I was at prior to that, people were looking at me like I was totally crazy for being there. Uh, that Thursday, I, I left and didn't come back until the following Monday and didn't leave my house uh, by that time as well. Uh, the other, I was at, basically, at, at, I was in uh, China, actually, on an economic development uh, uh, thing and fully approved by the Speaker of the House. And, they were aware that I wasn't there, and I guess they didn't need my vote on that bill because it passed without me, and I probably wouldn't have voted for it. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are times I've, I've served uh, the community. I think I've served it well. I think I've, I've recognized uh, uh, both sides, and, and you try to do that. Uh, so Thank you. So ask for your support in the upcoming Ms. election. Ms. Macias? Yes, um, I have to say I came here with intrepidation. This was a scary thing for me. Um, I, I do want to say I think this is the greatest thing that the, that the city, that the, the state of Arizona does is allow us to come and speak, even though I was really afraid to do that. Um, I, I would say to you, um, the Green Party is a party that takes no corporate money, no PAC money. We take no money from unions. We are solely run by... You folks, a dollar here, five dollars there. We, we are beholding to the voter. We are not beholding to corporations. Uh, we, we feel that that money has to get out of elections. People are what are important. Votes from you are what are important. And I would hope you would support the Green Party and myself and vote uh, Linda Macias for state rep. Thank you. Ms. Epstein. We love living here in this community and we want to protect the things that we love here, your schools, your job, your choices, and your children. We must work collaboratively to restore education funding. As a computer systems analyst, I've worked with teams of professionals in the Treasury at Citicorp and in the brass mill at Olin. As a really bad soccer player and an okay coach, I know the values of teamwork to get work done and for fun. When I finished my term on the Kyrene School Board, people thanked me for working transparently and including more people. To solve Arizona's complex education challenges, you deserve a representative who's who, who is prepared for the challenge with long-term experience and knowledge of the system. I have a track record of transparency and collaboration for over 25 years, bringing business and education together in statewide coalitions to forge strong solutions for the future. Thank you. Mr. Schmuck. Thank you to our moderator and to all of you for engaging and listening. Actions speak louder than words. Service is one of those actions. I've spent a career serving others as an Air Force officer, a Gulf War veteran, a professional pilot, and as a leader in our community and state on many civic and charitable minded projects. Five generations ago, my family, Henry Schmuck, fought for freedoms for all Americans at the Battle of Gettysburg. We are the people. And as Abraham Lincoln said, government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. I will fight for you, not the lobbyist and not the special interest and certainly not any out-of-touch establishment. A politician thinks of the next election, but a statesman thinks of the next generation. I will be your statesman. I humbly ask for your vote on or before November 8th, to bring integrity, service, and real leadership to the Arizona Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bowie. Thank you. I want to thank the Clean Elections uh, Commission for hosting and you all for being here. A very lively crowd tonight, so thank you. Uh, you know, this district is my home. I grew up about a mile away here in Chandler. So a lot of these issues that we're talking about, especially around education, are personal for me. You know, these schools that are being cut are the same, it's the same classrooms that I grew up in. So these are issues that I want to fight for at the state capitol. 
Uh, my two priorities, like I said earlier, is number one, restoring education funding, strengthening the schools that, that we have here that are already strong, but making them stronger. And second is really bringing some bipartisanship back to the state capital, because I think government works best when all voices have a seat at the table. Uh, I believe I have the experience, the education, the commitment to really represent our district well. At the end of the day, it's not about what's best for my party or special interests or lobbyists or the establishment. It's about what's best for our community, what's best for our district, how can we move our community forward. So I would appreciate your vote on or before November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. To our candidates, we thank you so much for participating in our forum. And to our audience members, we thank all of you for taking the time to come and inform yourselves before voting. We encourage you to visit www.azcleanelections.gov where you can find information on the upcoming elections, download the Clean Elections app, and learn about the candidates running for office. A link to the video of this debate as well as other Clean Elections debates will be posted on that site within 72 hours of the scheduled debate. Please fill out the debate evaluation form you received as you entered and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission and will help improve future debates. Thank you all for coming tonight, and you're welcome to stay and speak directly with the candidates.